All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our second session of the best practices series supporting the use of modern JS across your institution. I'm Jerry Miller, sector lead for the education team. And uh, Peter Noop at University of Michigan is here. Um, so we've, you, you've, those of you that were in the previous session already met Peter. Um, Peter has been helping us run all of these workshops for a number of years now and has taken the lead and, and shared some of the knowledge that they have at Michigan. Um, Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Jerry Sedham at the University of Michigan. I'm a research computing consultant there in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and uh, do uh, some of the administration of ArcGIS online, but most of my time I like to spend helping users use GIS. Wonderful, thank you. And then we also have um, a couple of presenters. So Erin Much and Carlos Barahona um, are going to be joining us as well. Um, and if you, if you folks want to come on camera, Erin and Carlos for a second and just... Um, do a brief introduction um, just to who you are. Erin, if you'd like to go first. Hi, thank you. This is um, a pleasure to be here and share um, our story of how we um, utilize GIS at uh, University of California Merced. So thanks for having me here. Wonderful. Thanks, Erin and yeah. Carlos. Um, hi, my name is Carlos Barona. Uh, I am a systems architect uh, with UC Davis and in the College of Agriculture and Bio Environmental Sciences. Wonderful, thank you. So thank you both for being here. So what we're going to do is, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the second session of our best practices series. I think a lot of you just looking at the attendee list, attendees list were in the first session, which covered what some of those best practices are. In this session, we'll take a look at um, how we get to those best practices. We'll do a little bit of a recap. We'll take a look at how we get to those practices, to those best practices. Um, and this is what Carlos and Aaron are gonna be sharing. And we'll talk a little bit more on how we support, now that we're there, how do we provide support for all those constituents on campus? And then we have a third session coming up as well, and that is how to provide access to non-SAS components and particularly focusing on virtualization um, to working with students, faculty, staff that have Mac machines or Windows PCs and how we distribute that access for anything that is not RGS online. So that's what, what our third session is going to cover. So you guys are in, um, attendees that is in a listen only mode please do type questions in the q a and in the chat at any time as we go along um we'll we should have time to address a lot a lot of questions at the end um and if those that cannot we cannot address we'll figure out another way to answer them um if you want to direct things to a specific person please specify their name um, and then, of course, all of the, these sessions they're recorded the recordings are going to be available at um, the proceedings in a couple of weeks so the way this session is going to flow this this brief introduction for five minutes all of the panelists are going to share um, and then answer a couple of questions so how did you get to the best practices state how do you position your institution or your community to be ready for modern GIS? Um, and then how do you support that user base how do you see it grow um, and then how much is time is spent managing RGS versus helping users or supporting users use GIS? they're two fundamentally different things and it's an important distinguish um, I, the two important items to distinguish and we'll wrap up with a Q&A so as a recap Foundations of best practices, what we covered in the previous session, treating JS as a resource to your entire institution, to everyone across the institution. When we think of an appropriate analogy, other institution-wide technologies, uh, such as Word documents or PowerPoints or PDFs, so th these sorts of technologies that anyone can get access to. We don't have to go specifically ask for someone to access. Um, and taking that sort of an approach is what we're talking about in this case. So these are fundamental sort of foundations that are important. Um, treating everyone or treat Jess as a resource, resource for the entire institution, leveraging automation to scalably manage it. And really, again, when we think about we're serving a whole community, so how does that community get access to the technology in a scalable way? We want to minimize some of the transaction and make it as efficient as possible. And one of the most important things is the collaboration uh, with key stakeholders. And you will see that through all the talks that are coming up, um, working with our colleagues across campus that can make that possible. 
these are the best practices. We're not going to go over them. We covered them in the previous session and we'll share some resources as we go along to take a look at what those best practices are. Of course, institution agreement that is that covers the whole camps, campus. Central funding is an important notion if we're in there to kind of work toward that because we do see a lot of um, you know, disadvantages with chargebacks and, and so on. Single sign-on enterprise accounts, this notion of auto provisioning, people joining, coming in, logging into our GES organization, they already have what they need to do to do their work and a number of other items. But with that, again, this is what was covered in the previous session. If you missed it, we'll share resources um, at the proceedings. And I'll also share a blog um, here shortly with some of these best practices. But with that, we'll let Erin, our first panelist, share their story. And I'll stop sharing and we'll let you share, Erin. Thank you. If you were in the last session, uh, I think Jerry mentioned 2004. And um, when I was typing up this uh, PowerPoint, I kept typing in 2004 because today is the day of my 17 year old's birthday. Uh, yesterday was my 19 year old's birthday. So um, anyway, I just thought that was interesting. So 2004 was definitely a pivotal year personally, but I will, um, I'll try not to go too far into the details, but I do want to talk about um, how we support modern GIS at the University of California, Merced. Um, quick introduction, I am the founding manager of the GIS Center. We um, were formerly under the Office of Research, and we have pivoted and moved to the University Library since 2016. Um, and they have agreed to centrally fund the license. So to cut to the chase, the OIT said, take the keys, run with it, um, pay for it. And then um, it, it, was a, it was a cost that the university library is willing to, um, to absorb because they believed that um, this was a benefit to the university and a benefit to the library to manage. Just a quick picture of where UC Merced is, because many don't know where UC Merced is or heard of UC Merced. We are actually in the um, we are in the Central Valley of California, where the hub of agriculture and um, all sorts of activities related to farming. We are just south of UC Davis, about two hours south, but we're close to San Francisco, um, Yosemite National Park. We have a lot of research there and at Sequoia um, Kings Canyon, in addition to the research in the Central Valley. This is a picture of our new campus. We were established in 2005, I believe. And we had this new project called um, 2020 project where all of our new buildings would open in fall 2020. And of course the pandemic uh, delayed that, but we basically doubled our size in three years. Since I started the university, we had about 5,000 students and now we're closing in to 9,000. A quick note too, we were also a recipient of um, a surprise $20 million um, endowment from Mackenzie Scott. I could I don't have time to talk about that in detail, but uh, we, meaning the university, because of our work and um, critical um, studies of race studies, equity, um, a, a lot of our research and our student body focuses on those areas but that's for a different discussion. So really what we're getting down to is the discussion of enabling single sign-on and how we went about doing that. And um, it took a few months. It wasn't that easy for us because I, I am not in LIT. We work together, our groups collaborate, but we're all short-staffed, we're growing so quickly. So it's kind of like there's, the structure may not be as clean as maybe other universities, but um, it took a few months and um, I worked with our own library IT director, who's just um, basically three people now. And he helped me facilitate uh, who to talk to at OIT. We kind of figured out, okay, how do we go about en enabling single sign-on? So it did rely on um, our IT department collaborating. At first I tried to do it myself. I sat on Peter's um, workshops like, oh, I can figure this out on my own. I don't need IOT. But uh, after struggling a little bit because I don't have access to some of the resources, our IT director, uh, we went on the whiteboard, we figured out you know, the process and 
our user base and kind of justifying to OIT why we need single sign-on. And so Esri also set us up with a sandbox site for testing, which was very useful. So we were able to test out um, the logins before we went live because we had about 206, we had 206 users when we initiated single sign-on. But um, this did take a while again, and we really didn't make any um, major traction until I had faculty starting to pressure me to say, this is important, we need to do this. And so that helped initiate that transition. So faculty support was key into initiating single sign-on. So we implemented single sign-on. We had 206 legacy users or users we set up individually. And now we have almost 1,100. So that's a pretty significant jump um, in a matter of less than two years. We really don't have GIS courses at UC Merced. So it's like, well, why would you implement ArcGIS online if there's really not a lot of GIS training? Um, again, we moved out of the Office of Research to the library as a, this is, this is a resource. This is an information resource. This is building story maps. This is accessing the living atlas. This is not this desktop GIS approach. This is, this is spatial discovery, discovery of resources. Um, I do maintain a lot faculty list of active GIS users, so I collaborate with them. Again, it's it's a little hard because sometimes it's knocking on the door or saying hi or saying, hey, let's meet for coffee and talk about your needs. Um, and I also maintain a list of our labs that use GIS, research specific. I have some dashboards that kind of break down how um, what our user base looks like. I do have an outreach mailing list, which um, has been very useful. We have hosted a um, event on campus for about 100 people. And then we all also offer a lot of workshops, information se sessions, and we try to maintain our documentation. We work on LibGuides. So again, having, having us maintained through the library is a way that we've been discovered. And, um, and I mentioned in a future slide, some of it's word of mouth. Um, so some of the outcomes, and if you were in my session yesterday, um, I didn't disband our legacy users. So they still had access, um, but they're expected to be self-service. So if they want to use ArcMap and run a concurrent license server on Linux box, they can do that, but we're not responsible for any like, glitches. And with that rapid increase of users, we were able to focus more on research projects. Um, and we had more um, demand to say, hey, we, we need workshop, we need data support, we need you, you, we're going to involve you in this grant. Um, so that was also pretty um, important. And how did, and really, how did our user base grow? I kind of mentioned this already. Um, we encouraged migration out of ArcMap because we, we were saying Pro is free. So when people request ArcMap, we have a process where we vet out, we only allow existing experienced users of ArcMap. We do have a lot of new faculty that come on board with ArcMap training that want to use ArcMap. So when they do a license request, I have to say, have you used this before? Because if you haven't used it before, switch to Pro. Pro is easier. And we also tell our ArcMap users to use Pro in addition to Map if they can and, and work on the migration. A lot of them use third-party add-on for specific, specific modeling. So part of it is like, I don't want to, um, abandon those users, but we're just informing them like, okay, just plan to migrate. Um, a lot of our growth is just word of mouth, actually. So faculty are like, the GIS Center provides really great support. Talk to Aaron. Uh, basically, we're staffed with one and a half people and a part-time student. So um, luckily, we're small enough that I we can handle that. It gets overwhelming, but a lot of it is word of mouth. Like, hey, talk to Aaron. She'll, she'll help you. Um, so again, as I mentioned before, we used to recharge for these licenses, but when we abandoned the um, the cost model, our um, research service income doubled, and we were more self-supporting um, with funding after we provided software for free. So that was like that was the risk we took. Like we're not charging for every license, but because of that, our um, we're able to to support more publications. That's what we need. We need publications. We need research. We need exposure. So that's um, really, it was really amazing. So this is some sna uh, snapshot of our 
dashboard that we maintain. And this was inspired by Peter. Um, this is something my student this year put together. So I, I we can only take credit for providing her the data and she pulled all this together, um, which is really helpful for administration. Zooming in on our users, um, this is the spike when we initiated single sign-on. Um, Pre-single sign-on, these were areas where we took, took a spreadsheet and we added users um, automatically. Um, and we have, of course, some one-offs, but now that after single sign-on, we have um, an, a lot of users logging in and accessing. And we typically have 50 to 100 active users daily during the semester. So it's not like this they log in once and they never log in again. Uh, we also wanted to break down our ArcGIS Online users. So primarily they're undergraduates, primarily they're social sciences, um, but we do hit a lot of majors. Um, and we don't have a ton of majors, so we do have another field where we kind of, you know, anything under 2%, my student decided to aggregate into that, that pie chart. So it was um, readable, but history, political science, um, computer science, public health, management, sociology, it's, it's touching everything. Also looking at our ArcGIS Pro users, we have 260 active users now, um, and we have processes on how they download and install that for um, Mac for their own use. So it's not, again, it's self-service and we do provide support, but it, it's actually hasn't been as difficult as I thought it would be. Actually, we haven't had that many issues with Arc Pro, which is great. And I think a some of these are logins from virtual machines, but the campus does maintain their own concurrent license. So we don't track those users because um, we don't have access to that information. But this is a pretty good snapshot. Most of our pro users are seniors and juniors because that's those GIS classes that we have are usually upper division. Um, engineering is the heavy user of ARC Pro in addition to our graduate students. So that previous pie chart showed social sciences where half of our ArcGIS online users, but our pro and our um, you know, advanced desktop are usually in natural sciences, graduate studies. I'm getting the internet stability issue. So if I paused out, um, maybe I can go back, but um, having some tree work done today. Wanted to look at ArcMap users also. Um, we still support them. Most 90 plus percent are in research, not in instruction. Most of them are environmental systems and most of them are faculty and grad students. So that's kind of that migration of Okay, you can use ArcMap, but we don't promote it for the undergraduates. And this is just a snapshot coming in. In addition, we have, we've created um, individual roles that have different, um, that help us again track who's logging in. They, their initial role is an analyst. So every month we go in and look at our analyst roles and then we assign them to a new role, whether it's a postdoc, um, you see undergrads are 624. We also track alumni. Um, so it's, it's, um, it helps us kind of get a picture of who's using it. So when I log in every day, I just get a snapshot of kind of the user base and who's, who's coming in. Um, the most important thing, I guess, is the staffing effort. So it, it did take a lot of time for managing, um, the system estimate of 10% management, but a lot of that is just our, my student, um, who manages the dashboards and proxy users. Um, again, we removed that barrier of recharge, which expanded wider usage. A lot of our management time is more for dash dashboards, so we can promote and tell our leadership that um, this is how it's being used, so we can help us justify centralization, because I don't want to go and have to back charge, you know, different labs and units and try to chase that money. It's like, look, we're centralizing it, we're streamlining it, people are using it, and they're producing research, and that's really what we want to do. We're starting to utilize Python scripts. Um, and one of the issues for us is group sharing and connecting organizations. That demand is growing. And there's been some glitches with sharing within groups and ed sharing, editing, and story maps. So that's part of our staffing effort with ArcGIS Online. We do a lot of outreach and affiliation. So one of the one of the things that will lead us to Carlos's discussion is that our leadership committee. Um, talks about the system-wide licensing and we all work together. We have over 700 story maps created. So again, a lot of activity. So just as for the sake of time, I wanted to just acknowledge all of the um, players that kind of helped, um, helped us move to this environment. And I think I recommend it. For us, it wasn't as 
smooth as maybe I'd like it to. It, it took a little brute force, but it was definitely worth it. And I've had a lot of support with um, by Esri, with Angela, and uh, Rina, with um, Knowledge Peter New to inspire us. Amy work and Carlos. Um, we met at Esri two years ago and sat down and said, okay, you know, you're going to do this. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and, and then um, our University of California Merced folks, um, Amy Newsom's our GIS um, part-time specialist and Grace Nunnally is my student who's creating all these great dashboards. So that is all I have. I'll put my contact information in. And if you would like my dashboards, I will definitely share that. So, um, Thank you for your time and I hope you have some questions. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, so for wonderful story, and yes, please do share the dashboard link um, in the chat to all attendees and panelists. And let's go ahead. We got a couple of great questions, but let's go ahead and proceed with Carlos next and then Peter, and then we're gonna come back and answer a couple of those questions. So Carlos. You did. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Aaron and Jerry, very much. Um, I'm going to focus on a pretty similar story that this is at UC Davis. Uh, this is our moving forward from a recharge model to a semi centrally funded model for ArcGIS and um, just really how that helps us turn into a service that actually supports the wider use of ArcGIS rather than just providing access to licenses and license troubleshooting. So I already introduced myself, but brief background. I work in the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy within College of Agriculture and Environmental Science. Um, I'm mostly with a background in IT. I did some application development and data science. I've worked in research a bit. But I really mentioned this as context because I might not be the typical GIS manager. Um, but the, the background in research in IT, I think, helped us better utilize some like technical partnerships that we've had. Um, as well as utilize some of the academic and administrative champions within the departments and uh, at our uh, college dean's level. And that actually made things happen relatively quickly compared to what uh, we're hearing from UC Merced. So similar to UC Merced, and I'm sure a lot of you out there, um, specialized software at Davis is traditionally paid through through cost recovery. In the case of ArcGIS, this meant that we had our central software licensing team um, pay up front, and then we'd split out those costs by commitments per device. So what this really meant is we're paying for this institutional license, um, but we're individually provisioning about 230 individual licenses, um, and that would get billed to roughly 70 departments. So that's at least 70 transactions if they were coordinating well. Um, probably higher. That's a lot of staff time and we're not really recovering that much money per transaction and we're definitely not enabling use that way. So uh, I'm sure you heard this, like we've heard this from everybody today so far. The, the takeaway here is we spent way too much effort in gatekeeping. Um, we weren't really utilizing our, our agreement very well, both because we were limiting the availability and because we weren't supporting much beyond just ArcMap. Um, so in November 2018, we managed to get approval for joint funding from my college, the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, and the Office of the Provost. Uh, I'm going to mention again, this was really due to some key partnerships. Um, we had the support of our department chair and our college dean. This is largely because my college and my uh, GS kind of started at our university legacy through my department. Um, so both of those uh, partners really recognize the need and the, the business advantage, um, academic advantage of simplifying software distribution and actually enabling research. Um, so once they gave us that uh, approval, we were able to coordinate a campaign. Um, we had Esri come out and we did a kind of get the word out. Uh, this was just in time for GIS Day in 2018. Um, I think we build it something like if you attend, we will give you an ArcGIS license. So this is also to mention, this was during California's fires um, and we had a essentially shut down campus and we still had pretty good attendance during through all of this. Uh, we had students, faculty come out and we've kind of continued that. Um, that GS day has now turned into a GIS week event that we participate with all of the campuses as of last year. 
So that's if you're if any of you are at some UCs or know somebody there, talk to somebody local and we'll get you connected. I think we had 800 people last year. So that, that was a great event. Digressing, but all right. Um, by December 2018, we'd eliminated the recharge. And by the beginning of January 2019, we already had single sign on in place. We had concurrent licensing just uh, set up to uh, service our traditional ArcMap users. Um, and like I said, for us, enabling single sign on was almost the flick of a switch. I think I spent more time deciding whether to use ADFS versus Chibliss. Um, then it really took, I called somebody that I knew in identity and access management. A couple of days later, we had our, our app registered. So that's really, again, where those trusted partnerships come in handy. Um, I think finding the exact mix of new member defaults probably took a lot more time, but um, it, we really just end up auto-provisioning everything that we can at this point, largely at the advice of people like Jerry and Peter. Um, the cost of managing it granularly is just vastly more than making it all just generally available. Uh, what do we see after this? Uh, I'm kind of going to skip through this. So I'm not going to read through the slides, um, but ask for a follow-up later if you want. Uh, in terms of ArcMap, we honestly don't pay attention to it anymore. We have single or we have concurrent licensing set up. We have some really good KVs. It just works. I think we still manually provision maybe 40 licenses a year for field work, but that's actually handled by our central campus help desk. So we never see it. Uh, the keys here are provide some standardized installs, some really good documentation, and it makes it an on-demand service. It's pretty much eliminated all the staff time involved in buying, distributing, recharging licenses, and eliminated a lot of the IT work of coordinating that. Uh, where we really saw the difference though is ArcGIS Pro. Pre-2019, I think we had about 40 active users. Three years later today, I were cumulatively at a little more than 5,000, with 2,000 of those being active within the last 12 months. We're doing that same thing where Peter has talked about right now. We're kind of kicking the can down the road. We don't clean up our old users. They lose access according to our single sign-on stuff because that, that's all just ingrained in the institutional policies. Of those 2,000, about five to 600 of those are ArcGIS Pro, active ArcGIS Pro users. Um, for classes, though, this really meant that we could start shifting away from ArcMap and into ArcGIS Pro. And with single sign-on, it doesn't even matter really where they are anymore. All of our labs have this. Um, so they sit down at any computer and they can log in and immediately get a license. This is especially helpful if you suddenly have to move an entire university to remote learning as sometimes happens these days. Um, so with that, our lab managers, both in the physical labs and now in our VDI environment, are just as self-sufficient as any other ArcGIS user on campus. Unless I contact them, we don't hear from them. It just works. Um, so I don't know if you caught in the last slide, there was a pretty big discrepancy where I'm, some of the counts that I mentioned. Of the 2,000 active users that we currently have in the last year, um, only about a third of those are using traditional GIS software. We have about 80% of our uh, user base are students, but really everybody is using more and more of the off-core JS products, not the, the desktop products. Um, don't spend too much time looking at these charts, but I do want to point something out in that bottom left. Um, that it, that's our new user dashboard. Um, but I want you to point. I want to point out those spikes that you see once or twice a quarter, and how they basically went away during uh, 2020 and 2021. Those were actually from a non-GIS. I think it's a plant science class. Um, might be bioinformational sciences, but we'd have about 600 students per quarter that had nothing to do with GIS. They'd go out and start geomapping the campus and the, the, the city as well um, in a project identifying plant diversity in the area. Sadly, this went away in 2020 and 2021 because of COVID, but it, it is the perfect example of non-traditional use that just wouldn't have been available for, uh, for our students with the old model. So we've made ArcGIS at UC Davis self-sufficient, right? What do I do with all my free time? 
much like highways, additional capacity doesn't mean less traffic. Uh, we're starting to find out that while we can serve way more clients, that many clients really comes with a lot of needs beyond licensing. Um, being an IT shop, we're really good at creating support models and we already had a lot of support channels in place. Uh, we used a lot of our institutional policies and worked with our central help desk to write up some really good KDs. Um, the central help desk now has some standard operating procedures for what the tickets that they get. And that's what you're seeing in that bottom left-hand corner. Those blue and green right there, that's essentially the central help desk software licensing and um, IT help. The yellow is, is my team. And we ended up taking just as many tickets that were as were existed before, but we're now looking at specialized help. So that's, we're getting pulled into way more consults with clients, trying to do something unique or just really understand web GIS, modern GIS, and try to better utilize it. It's a good problem to have um, because it means we're actually now utilizing and addressing that underutilization problem that we talked about up front, um, but it's a problem nonetheless. And that's the challenge that we're hoping to conquer. I think we're, we've done a good job in trying to better utilize our connections across the system as well. Aaron's talked about that, um, that we have a UCGIS uh, uh, system-wide group, and we, we're really trying to utilize each other's knowledge and start to build up these knowledge bases out of, out of the, the assistance through there. Um, that's where I'm going to stop, but I similarly, we're, we want to thank Jerry, Peter, uh, Rena, um, especially, like I said, uh, we were able to do this only because we had our champions in the College of Ag and my department in environmental sciences. Um, largely, that was the, the people that you're seeing here, Bob, Karen, Helene, and uh, the last person I really want to mention is Bala, who works at the system level. He works with the UCOP, and he's the, really the one that has enabled all of us in the UC system being able to work with this. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, very enlightening and inspiring. So just for the sake of time, we'll keep on going with Peter. Um, so and after Peter shares his story, we'll come back with some Q&A. Yeah, I think, you know, I think you've heard some uh, good stories here from people who have done it more recently. Our message uh, from our campus is a little dated at this point, so I may skip a few slides, um, but we'll see where we go. So what GIS do we support? Uh, certainly the Esri ArcGIS technology is mostly what we're going to talk about. We support a lot of other things, though, that our, our users use, but dominantly our user base, because so easy to scale up usage is, is Esri's ArcGIS. So what does our GIS community look like? Uh, we've got a dashboard here that shows the characteristics from a few days ago, June 19th. But you know, rather than getting lost in the numbers, what I want to highlight here is that even though we have 7,057 registered users, only about 4,500 are authorized users. The rest are students who have graduated or faculty who have retired or people who have otherwise moved on. But of those users, if we start looking at individual units in our campus, there's at least one user in over 80% of uh, our units across uh, the university. I should say across the university, because this also includes our Flint and Dearborn campuses as well. And similarly, when we look at degree programs, if we just look at our student users, over 85% of the degree programs have at least one student using uh, GIS. And this big white slice is actually an other slice. So there's not really dominant. It's just across the board, we see lots of users. Now, of those 4,500 users, if we start looking at how often people are using the system, we have about 500 unique logins each week and about 900 each month. So, you know, not everybody's using GIS all the time, which is what we would expect. In fact, if we look on a daily basis, this is runs from about 2015 to present, showing the different usage of apps, and it's quite a noisy chart. But what I'll draw your attention to is the red line, of course, shows our GIS usage continues to grow. Uh, even this year, we have more than last year. But we see a pattern here, sort of a bimodal distribution, in that we have lightweight GIS users, about 3,000 of these a year, that are sporadic users, people who use story maps once or twice, field maps, survey one to three, RTS online for something. And then we have our heavyweight GIS users, about 150 people a day that are consistently using ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS online. And I should point out, this is our teaching and research usage, our administrators, so things like facilities are in a different uh, instance. So these numbers, uh, don't include them. That would bring in uh, quite a few other consistent users. 
So when it comes to supporting this community, uh, we like to break it down into two different sort of roles. There's managing GIS or supporting the software. These are things that we do on behalf of the users, things like enabling single sign-on. We'd only have to do that once. Uh, credit budgeting, turn it on once, new member defaults. Maybe you have to update that every now and then when as you release something new, download the new installers, license provisioning. But these are all things that don't scale with the number of users, so we can do it for everybody. It costs the same and pretty much requires almost nothing uh, in terms of commitment once done. It's the kind of thing that requires a combination of IT and, and GIS knowledge. Now, the fun part is helping users use GIS or supporting the people. This is something where we're doing things on behalf of individual users or groups, consulting with users on how to do things, teaching workshops, preparing documentation. This requires a lot of GIS knowledge, but it also scales with the number of users. The more users you have, the more help people need using the system. So going back to the first part, the managing GIS or the dealing with the software, who's involved? Who are our ArcGIS Online administrators? Well, we've got three people in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. It's myself and, and Technology Services and two of my colleagues. We have two people over in the library system and then one person from our central IT group. And what's our combined effort? So among the six of us, all together, we spend less than two weeks a uh, year doing things related to managing the software, things like resetting credit allocation, updating new member defaults, uh, and so on. And part of this is because we did some one-time tasks to ensure this sort of automated scalability. In 2012, when it became possible to use single sign-on in SAML, that allowed us to automate user management. In 2015, we scripted the auto provision of enterprise accounts for authorized users so that we could give everyone access to everything automatically. Now you can do that with new member defaults, so you don't even need to use scripting anymore. At the same time, they introduced credit budgeting and assigned credit allocations. For us, this was that way of enforcing reasonable use. So give everyone access to everything, but just keep them in check by giving a credit allocation so they don't get runaway processes. And now when it's talking about the scope of managing GIS, ourselves, the library and ITS, we take care of it for all of campus, just because it's simple. It's you know very little amount of our time to do it. But if we switch to looking at helping people use GIS, well, our group, our LSNA represents maybe a third of the users of our GIS. And so we only really help those users, the library, CSCAR, one of our statistics group, ITS, they're still there to help all of campus. And then we have pockets around campus, the School of Public Health, uh, School of Environment and Sustainability, the Medical Center and other places where there's, you might think of power users locally where people will turn to ask them questions first. So we have people spread all over campus helping. Uh, we also have the facilities and operation information services that take care of administrative users of GIS. But the notion here is that we really have a decentralized distributed model of support. There's about 10 to 12 people around campus contributing about six FTEs of effort. The cost is borne by the individual units. And as a result of that, the scope of the responsibility varies by unit. The library covers all of campus with its two people. We cover just LSNA with our two and a quarter people. But we like to present this to the users around the university as a single model. So we do a lot of grassroots coordination behind the scenes, but that really helps us succeed here. We have a single GIS support email and shared ticket system, so we can all keep track of what's going on, but we only have to deal with our own users. We meet once a month or more often informally to share information. We do a lot of cross-training and group professional development projects. So if someone in one unit, you know, it's really hard for one person to keep track of everything Esri. So if someone in one unit maybe gets a question from a user about a piece of Esri software they haven't used before or out there familiar with, they can reach out to one of us who may have had experience with it and we can work together and hopefully bring them up to speed on it as well as the user. So how do we help people use GIS? Well, as I mentioned, we have that shared email ticket system. We have a, an experience builder website where a lot of our documentation lives. Uh, the library and CSCAR and ourselves teach a number of uh, workshops. Uh, throughout the semesters. Both the library and us offer drop-in office hours for folks. We also do scheduled consultations. Uh, ourselves and CSCAR do grant-funded work. So for larger projects that need some assistance uh, and they're going to write us in their budgets, we'll work with them. Uh, one of the things we do a lot in LSNA is, is mentorship, where we may have a faculty member who comes to us with some task and research or teaching need uh, that has a good GIS solution, but they're not familiar with GIS. So we'll help them find a student uh, in their domain who's interested in learning GIS and work with that faculty member so that they provide the domain expertise and we provide the GIS expertise to mentor the student. We also do partnerships with instructors and researchers. This is sort of our, our innovation pipeline kind of approach where we look for faculty who are fault tolerant but like to play with new toys. 
and we'll introduce them to new things in GIS and work with them closely. You know, if maybe they're doing field research. When Collector first went out, we picked a few groups to work with. We actually went into the field with them. So we got them to use the new software. And when things went wrong, we were there to troubleshoot it so it didn't derail their research projects. But we were able to use that to develop best practices so we could hand those off to people who followed in their footsteps so that we don't need to go into the field with every single group interested in going out there. So the funding of GIS, well, the management of GIS, you know, it takes very little of our time. It's a very fraction of the budget. And so we just do it for everybody. You know, even though I'm in LSNA, we just take care of it for the entire university. It would probably cost us more money if we started, you know, having to introduce ifs and thens and, and move things around depending on what roles you are. It's just simply do it for everyone. Helping people use GIS is where the big amount of money on our campus at least is spent. So we've got six FTEs uh, helping folks use GIS. And of course, as GIS use increases, the need for support also increases. When we first started using ArcGIS Online in 2012, we had zero GIS support folks in LSNA. And as of 2019, we're up to two and a quarter and our usage continues to grow. So we're probably gonna have to expand that more as well. And the other cost is the ESRI uh, Academic Institution Agreement. And I think if you heard already from some of the folks, it's a tiny cost as well. In fact, back in the 1990s, our Office of Research moved away from the recharge model uh, to just a single, they would buy it and we just give it, turn around and give it away for free on campus because we're just costing more money to recover the do cost recovery than it was to just pay for it once. In 2014, sort of reflecting the shift of previously just being GIS workstations and researchers, we moved to a model where uh, everyone's using it on campus with web tools. So we shifted it to our central IT organization who's already paying for all the other university-wide software. And certainly in comparison, the ESRI site license is a very small cost. So some of the lessons we learned here is that it takes a lot more effort to restrict access than to simply just give it away to everybody. It's also easier and less obstructive to limit how much users can do rather than what they can do. So things like enforcing these views through credit allocations rather than sticking up barriers to access to licenses. And it's less expensive and simpler to centrally fund than to do cost recovery. So fund, fund your site license at institutional level. And I think one of the signs you succeeded is that if you don't know what all your users are doing with GIS, then you're doing it right. So just to sort of wrap up here and move on to our QA and the key take home messages I think we have from all three of these talks are that treat GIS as a resource for your entire institution. Legacy style GIS doesn't go away. The desktop users are still there. It's just become part of the modern GIS. And then providing unfettered access creates additional opportunities for your students to gain experience with this. They can go in and teach themselves. And then new, new research and learning opportunities are being enabled by doing this easy access to modern GIS. They're not having to go through gatekeepers or barriers. They can just dive right in. And then leveraging the best practices around automation is really what helps you scalably manage GIS. So that central funding, uh, the single sign-on uh, timeline may take a few days, it may take a year we've seen in some places, but it's an important step to take. And then supporting the users, not the software, scales with the number of users. So prepare yourself for having to hire perhaps more support staff. And then finally, a key part of all of this is collaboration and building trusted relationships among the various stakeholders to turn this into an institution by resource. And then I'm sure we have some questions. Hopefully we have enough time left for a few of those. Yes, we do. We have a couple of minutes. So let's stop the sharing and we'll invite the panelists to all come on camera. And um, one question that came up a couple of times, actually, it was about um, the usage dashboard. Um, and Aaron, you addressed one of the questions in terms of how you um, basically, um, how did you get that data from the usage dashboard? So within RGS Online or from your university records? And it was sort of a follow-up question. Does, where does that info come from? Students, faculty, staff, major, and so on. So Aaron, you partially answered it, but I wanted to allow Peter the opportunity to answer as well, um, just to, to see how you guys do it. So Peter at Michigan, uh, especially since you were the first one to launch the dashboard like that. Yeah, in fact, I just dropped a URL in the chat, which will take you to a story map uh, that describes how you can build one of these dashboards for yourself, at least building the part with the ArcGIS statistics. So that you know number of registered users, the unique logins per week and month, all that data is being tracked by ArcGIS Online. And so you can run a notebook that's in that uh, story map and you'll have yourself that part of the dashboard uh, within minutes. 
The part that's more complicated is the majors and degrees and units because you have to mix in data from your own uh, directory services, your own institutions authoritative systems. And that's really a one off for each university as to how you're going to do that. But generally a key thing, if you don't have access to it, uh, reach out to your central IT group and, and find out how to get hold of your, your LDAP or ADFS and, and, and Carlos may have something to add to that as well. Um, and that, that's actually been a kind of a struggle for us just because we have a lot of policy on like what data is allowed to be shared where. So we, we're not really allowed to store those majors outside of our, our student information system. So while I can aggregate that, it's not a very efficient way to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And it does sound like we're out of time. There are a couple of questions that came up about accessibility, which could go all different kinds of ways. Uh, we're not going to have time to address that in this particular session. We are going to have a SIG on site license administrators a little bit later today. Perhaps join us there and we can all learn from one another. I know there are different ways institutions are approaching this and such. So that could be a question that we can follow up there. Um, and another question, Joe Copera, thank you for um, asking that in the chat and we're, looks like we're going to run out of time to answer it. Um, but I think Carlos and Aaron addressed some of that in terms of um, justifications that uh, people use when talking with administration to try to, um, to move everything to centralized, bill, centralized billing and cost recovery. And um, again, we're sort of out of time, but it's an important question. So maybe for a minute, Carlos um, and Aaron, if you wish, wish to comment on that, if anyone who is willing to stay a little bit longer. So what are some of the justifications that you guys use? You described it, but um, anything specific to elaborate on? I think the, the dashboards are really important. Even if you can't share them publicly, having that information at hand to be able to show to your leadership. We got a lot of traction just by showing like my college alone was 50% of the, the usage and we're, we're bearing most of that administrative cost. So being able to show that and like consistently show that it's widely used, we, it, it, we're spending way too much money on trying to recover it. Great, and Erin, do you have anything to add before we end the meeting? Yeah, I mean, we were, we were able, I don't wanna say to get away with it, but um, it was more of a, let's just try this out and see what happens. We are a new university, so we don't have a lot of, existing silos that have prevented us from trying some new things out. So um, issuing the licensing and seeing what happens um, was, um, was a, it was a, was a risk. It definitely was a risk, but we did have a recharge policy in place before we did that. So how we handle any support is any consultations that go beyond um, four hours is, is kind of our threshold then we will go to either the um, the classes that teach GIS and say, you need to provide us some instructional support, or we go to the research labs that have grant monies and say, if, you know, if your student is using us or we're providing services, then we, we charge for that. But um, giving out the license and letting people work with the software has expanded research and learning, um, which is great. Wonderful. Go ahead, I think Peter. one thing I might add to that is sometimes if you're just getting into this it's sort of a chicken and an egg until you get everyone on your campus using it it's hard to show that everyone on your campus is using it to justify the institution wide but i think you know the fact that erin shared her dashboards ours are certainly publicly available you can show that even if you don't have institution wide use today that's where you're going to end up at once you do all these things so you might as well get ahead of the game and, and start centrally funded it now and just simplify all this. It might be, it might be a way to start that too. Like, look, <laughs> look, leadership, here's what's happening at other universities when it happened. Absolutely. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for Peter to you know, helping for co organizing uh, the session and then to Carlos and Aaron for um, joining us and sharing their story and to all of you guys attendees. So, with that, we'll go ahead and end the session and we'll see you in one of the next ones.